After binge watching so many Let's Read YouTube videos, I finally decided to submit a story of my own. I am a 19 year old girl as I'm writing this, and at the time of the story, I had just turned 18 years old and was in the first few months of my senior year of high school. One weekend, my twin sister and I went to the mall about a half hour's drive from where we lived. She had to repair a necklace that she had bought at one of the in-mall jewelers. Right before we walked into the jewelry store, we were confronted by a boy that looked to be about the same age as us. He gave us a flyer advertising a party he was hosting about a week later. He told us it would be an absolute rager and that we should add him on Snapchat. So, naturally, we both did, and his name was Woonie. So at this point in my life, I have never been to a real party. I drank and smoked quite often and experimented with psychedelics from time to time, but only with a couple of my close friends. I always envied the popular crowd at my school, posting Snapchat stories of them at parties with kids in the grade above mine. I'm conventionally attractive and get along with people pretty easily, so I was confused and angry that people would never invite me to things. Looking back, I know it's because for some reason I had such a goody-goody facade and still kind of do, even though people didn't really know anything about me. If people learned that I was into that kind of stuff, their response has always been something along the lines of, oh my god, really? You seem so innocent, I'd never expect you doing anything like that. But I digress. But as you might expect, I jumped at the chance to go to any party, even if I didn't know anyone there. I would just bring my best friend or twin sister along with me. Throughout the week, as I clicked through my Snapchat stories, I'd see the party being advertised on Mooney's story. It had the name of some local DJ I'd never heard of and said the address would be released a few hours before the party. I was getting so pumped. I had no idea what to expect. Friday night comes along after eagerly waiting all week. My twin already had plans that night, so I decided on bringing my best friend. I invited her over to my house hours before the party so we could decide what to wear. After the address was released, we started on our way. I didn't pay any attention to where exactly the party was, just how far of a drive it would be. It was about 15 minutes away from my house. As we got closer to our destination, I realized that we weren't exactly in the best part of town. I knew this because it was relatively close to where my grandparents lived and my mom always said that there was a lot of crime there. I didn't really mind, it didn't faze me too much because I knew if it came down to it, I knew what measures to take to keep myself out of harm's way and when to remove myself from situations before they got out of hand. Plus, my best friend always carried a pocket knife on her. Never would I think we would actually need it, and I kind of always forgot she even carried it with her. We arrive, and we're about one or two blocks from the house. I didn't know that there were going to be so many people there, so we had to park a street over from the house. We could hear music blaring from where we parked. This made me even more excited. So this is what an actual party is like. We walked up to the house and it looked really old and beat up. It wasn't small, but the surrounding neighborhood was pretty bad. And there's, I kid you not, a line at the door like it's some kind of exclusive club. I thought this was completely normal since I was inexperienced in the party scene. Once we get up to the door, there's two guys acting like bouncers and making sure that guys paid the $5 to get in. Girls got in for free and there was a little boy who couldn't have been older than 10 also on the porch patting people down. They informed us that they wanted to make sure nobody brought guns. What? Why would they have to worry about that? And this obviously made me uncomfortable. But I mean, they were checking people, I guess, so it alleviated some of my anxiety. But I really didn't want a 10-year-old boy who definitely wasn't trained in security in any way patting me down. So I stepped back with my hands up and emptied my pockets. I said... I don't have anything. I wasn't even carrying a bag, and I was in a tank top and jean shorts. I couldn't hide anything anyways. They proceeded to let us in, and apparently the party was downstairs, so we headed in that direction. The basement was unfinished, and the walls, ceilings, and floors were all just concrete. I remember the lights were off, and they had strobe lights flashing everywhere. It was so loud I couldn't even hear my friend talking to me when she was standing right next to me. We didn't know anybody there, so we just started mingling and trying to find someone with alcohol. 
We made our rounds talking to people and managed to get a few shots from people in exchange for a hit or two off of our mini bong that my friend brought in her bag. We danced a little bit with our new friends and I honestly was having a really fun time. The DJ puts cups on a table in front of his equipment and said that it was real lean. I had just started dabbling in new substances and had been wanting to try the purple drink and it was my first real party after all, so why not? My friend and I each took a glass and chugged it. It didn't take long to start feeling the effects. Drinking alcohol and smoking earlier definitely added to it. I felt kind of loopy, but I was still having a good time. A few minutes later, my friend said she wanted to get a glass of water. The only bathroom was upstairs, so I went with her to try and find it. When we got up to the main floor, there were two middle-aged men just watching TV in the living room. I presumed that they were the homeowners, so I thanked them for having so many people over and told them I was having fun. They were glad. I asked them where the bathroom was because we were just going to get water from the tap. One of the men stood up and got two bottled waters out of the fridge for us. It was really loud and crowded and hot downstairs, so we just decided to stay up there for a while to collect ourselves. They asked if we wanted to sit and watch TV with them. I said sure because I was honestly really tired from standing around down there. We chilled and told them where we went to school and talked about our jobs and hobbies. They were being friendly and pleasant and I really liked actually being able to meet new people without all of the noise. They offered us shots and said we can have as much as we wanted and we both casually sipped off of it a few times. They even offered to share their joint with us. I was sitting on the middle couch cushion and the two men were on either side of me while my friend was on the nearby armchair. After hanging out and fooling around for a while, she said that she left her bag downstairs and went to go get it. When she left, the two men both started inching closer to me. I was pretty messed up at this point, so I didn't really think much of it or care too much. Only when one started rubbing my leg that I started to get weirded out. The other one joined in too, and I just sat there, confused for a few seconds. It took me longer than normal to realize what they were trying to do. One started to move his hand closer to my inner thigh. He took my hand and put it on his pants. I got pretty freaked out and jumped up off of the couch and said that I used the bathroom. My friend came upstairs at this point and I told her that we should leave. She came to the bathroom with me and I explained everything to her. We decided we'd thank the guys for having us over and sharing their stuff with us and then leave as soon as possible. When we said we had to head out because it was getting late, they acted all sad and tried to convince us to stay. I said I had a curfew and was already out later than I was supposed to be so we had to go. We made our way out to the door and both of them followed us. One said he really needed a ride home and we were the only people he knew with a car to take him. This really scared me and I knew it wasn't true. I said I didn't have enough gas and that I wish I could help him out but we really had to be going home. He offered gas money but of course I still said no. It was too late and I didn't want to be driving all over the place while still being kind of messed up and I also had to take my friend home. They started getting angry and said, Man, you girls gonna be invited to a party for free and steal our liquor and weed, but not do anything in return for us, huh? Even though they offered all of that stuff to us and we had some stuff of our own that we said we were willing to share. Man, I'm about to destroy y'all. At this point, I was terrified, almost frozen in my tracks. I saw my friend put her hand over the pocket that held her knife. A few of the teenagers from downstairs came out as they must have been leaving too. They asked the two men about something I don't remember, but my friend whispered that we had to go to the car while we had the chance and their backs were sort of turned away from us. We just turned the other way, started fast walking in the direction of our car. I didn't want to make any sudden movements so once we had a considerable distance between them and us, we booked it to the car. I locked the doors as soon as we got in and sped off as soon as possible. Later. I found out that that party got busted by the cops, so I'm glad we left when we did. It was scary at the time, but I realize now how bad it could have turned out. I'm way more cautious with what I put in my body and how much. I still have way too friendly and accommodating personality, and I try not to assume that people have ulterior motives, but I know I have to be safer around strangers. A lot has happened in my life since then, so... 
thankfully that night rarely crosses my mind anymore. It's kind of funny now that I've been to so many parties, I realize how crazy and normal that one actually was. I don't accept invites to parties from random people anymore. In 2010, I set off from Treasury Island near San Francisco at around 4 p.m. Great wind, swell, and good ebb. There were several sailors out, including a good friend, and there was a pretty thick fog between Treasure Island and Angel Island. I sailed upwind a bit and ventured too far into the fog towards Angel Island. After about 30 minutes of sailing, my mast and board came apart as I was landing a jump. I was left with my rig in my hands while the board popped downwind due to the momentum. After a second shock, I left go of the rig and swam towards the board as hard as I could, but couldn't reach it as it was being pushed away by the swell and the ebb against me. I chased the board for a few more minutes until it faded away. At that point, I was lost in the middle of the bay in thick fog and too far from the other windsurfers to be seen or heard. I didn't have a radio, strobe, or anything useful for rescue. I started swimming towards where I thought Treasure Island was, as I only had the sun as a beacon. As I swam, several boats, sails, and motors came close to me less than a hundred feet. I yelled and waved like crazy, but I was just a point in the swell and no one saw me. After maybe thirty minutes of swimming, the fog got lighter behind me, revealing Angel Island. I then realized I was much closer to Angel than to Treasure Island probably because I had sailed further than I thought and because of the ebb. I then turned around and swam towards Angel for a long time. At some point, I got really bad cramp in my calf and I thought I was done for then. It took me a few minutes to stretch while in the water and relax the muscle enough before I could swim again. Angel was getting closer but at a slow pace and ebb was pushing me sideways. And of course, there is always the thought of great white sharks that infest these waters. As boats kept passing by, I waved at them just in case, but each time my hope was drained away like the little energy that was in my body. I was now less than a mile south of Angel Island, but wasn't sure if I would make it because of the current. Then, against all odds, someone on the Sausalito ferry saw me as the boat passed by. The ferry turned around, picked me up, and took me to Sausalito. After a check from the paramedics, a friendly couple gave me a ride back to my car. As a whole, I swam for about two and a half hours, although it felt much less. At the point I was rescued, I was starting to feel cold. I'm not sure how much longer I would have been able to keep swimming, maybe an hour. Thank you. Thank you so much for saving my life. I'm a 14-year-old female currently, but this event occurred at my grandmother's house during my 6th or 7th birthday. Before my grandmother passed, I would always have my birthday parties at her house, and we would invite the whole family and all the neighbors and their kids. Needless to say, the parties were always very large. There was this one neighbor girl who we'll call Katie. Katie was several years older than me, but we were friends and I always felt coal hanging around her. On the day of the birthday party, Kate and I were playing together at my grandmother's house and Kate took me outside. Oddly enough, there was no one around in the backyard despite the party being very large. My grandma had an above ground pool with a deck built around it. It was very hard to see if anyone was up there or in the pool from the ground. Kate brought me to the pool and I remember the water was swirling around in a circle. Kate told me that we were going to play a game where we would take off our crocs and put them in the swirling water and pick them up when they came back around. Kate did it first and picked her shoe out of the water when it came back around. She told me it was my turn. I put my shoe in the water and waited. It was coming back so I leaned in and to get it but it was barely out of reach. I leaned in further to grab it and I fell in. Shocked, I managed to get my head above the water and looked at Kate and screamed for help. I couldn't touch the bottom of the pool and I was not a very strong swimmer and the currents of the pool were keeping me from getting to the edge. Kate stood up and looked at me for a couple of seconds. 
Then she turned around and walked away. I was terrified. I thought maybe she was going to get help. I splashed and weakly cried for help, 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 but nobody was in the backyard. I don't know how long I was trying to tread water for, but I was struggling and swallowing a lot of water and kept slipping under. Suddenly I saw my grandma standing on the deck, and she jumped in with all of her clothes on and saved me. I'm so very thankful for her getting there on time. If she hadn't come a little later, I seriously believe that I could have drowned. But the story doesn't end here. Years later, I brought the story up to my grandma and she told me something that I hadn't known. When my grandma had noticed I wasn't with any of the other kids, she asked Kate where I was after she came inside. Kate just stared at her with a blank expression and didn't answer and just walked away. My grandma then said she went outside to look for me and barely heard me calling for help. I am truly thankful for that woman. May she rest in peace. Before I tell you this, there's a few things you should know. My ex-wife is bipolar, manic depressive type 1, and an alcoholic. I'm a bi-female, 5'5 five five and 115 pounds. She's a lesbian, 5'6 and 165 pounds. She was abusive. We lived on the second floor of a split house and the stairs went straight down all the way. Once, she strangled me with a bath towel after one beating. She left me naked, crying and gasping for breath between pleas not to die with strained voice on the bathroom floor. Why stay through all of that, you might ask? She was a honed predator, a master manipulator. I stayed because she had me totally isolated. I stayed because I had no money to leave. I stayed for my stepson who called me mom. I stayed because I loved her. And I stayed because I was scared to leave. I woke up in the middle of the night to someone thrashing around my living room. I turned to wake my then wife, but the bed was empty. My heart dropped in my stomach. I know what that means. My ex was drunk again, stumbling around making a mess. I asked where they had been, and I got a sneer. She said she went for a drive. I am very against driving intoxicated, and I responded, You shouldn't drink and drive. You could have hurt someone or gotten a ticket. My ex responded by beating me until I was in front of the stairs and... By then I was covered in bleeding defensive wounds with red welts and bruises forming that covered my arms, legs, chest, and back. The whole time she was saying vile and vulgar things. Once I was in front of the stairs she smiled with malice and pushed me down the stairs hard. I didn't lose consciousness and I guess I was whimpering from fear and pain because she ran down the stairs fist balled. Fear gave me the speed. I crawled between her wide-set legs up the stairs and ran up into the kitchen, desperately trying to get to the back door. I wasn't fast enough. She went out the front door and up the back steps. She was waiting for me in the kitchen. She stared me down. I was shaking, and it hurt to breathe. A few broken ribs I found out later. But I tried to stay calm. My ex pulled a large knife from the butcher block and took a step forward, knife poised. She looked at me with the nastiest look that wakes me up in cold sweat still and said in a monotone, slightly slurred and very aggressive voice, I'm having homicidal ideations. You should call somebody. She stabbed the fridge, then the counter. Luckily, it got stuck for a moment and I sprinted to the bedroom. Normally, I can budge the dresser, but adrenaline fueled me and I barricaded the door. I heard her walking and laughing and stabbing the walls. The cops came but couldn't find my door as it was unmarked. I had to move the dresser very hard and brave the dark hall with nothing to defend myself. I sprinted down the stairs and flagged an officer down. My ex was found on the roof, knife in hand. She wrote a note and it read, I'm still going to kill her. She can't take my death. It's better that she suffers more this way. There is more, but it's pretty, pretty graphic, so I'll leave it out. The cops got her down safely. I asked for leniency due to mental illness. They were charged with threatening me with the intent to commit terror, basic assault, and simple abuse, but I guess that's better than attempted murder and 
attempting to take her own life. For a bit of reference, I was fairly sheltered. I often thought that I was this tough kid when I was the furthest thing from it. I, 13 at the time, met this guy, apparently 17, online on a teen site. We ended up talking on MSN for ages, video chatting as well. I was really reckless and kind of a terrible teenager. My then friend and I took $50 from my mom's wallet and went from our town over to a city on a ferry. Then we bust and met up with the said guy. He didn't look older than 19. We all hung out and went to this mall. He told us to say that if we run into anyone he knows to say we were his cousins, which was fine. It was back when it was still weird to meet up with people online back in 2007. He got my nails done, which as a teen I was so excited for then, and some clothes from my friend, along with some illicit toys, which now that I look back at, I don't know how I didn't clue in that anything bad was going to happen. We left and sat in his car in the parking lot. My friend had left to go change into the shirt that he had bought her, and this guy leaned over and kissed me. I froze. This was my first kiss. In shock, I just kind of let it happen. I was such a shy person and no guy had ever done this to me as I was unattractive and overweight, constantly bullied so at the time I didn't ever think it was going to happen. She came back and we went for a drive. During it, he repeatedly referenced taking us and bringing us to a pig farm like Robert Picton, a serial killer who would feed his victims to pigs, almost as if though he was joking. So we took it like that, but thinking back, he had a serious look on his face and monotone. My friend and I started talking and he got mad and snapped on us, for seemingly nothing at that, while we were driving around in these very secluded areas. He finally brought us to a pretty deserted park. We got out and hung around the skate park part of the place. He got pretty handsy. My friend and me kept distancing more as he kind of was creeping us out more now. We finally get to the car and he locked the doors. We were just all hanging around and he kept making weird and creepy comments about us staying and that we were so far away from home that no one knew where we were, which was true, and that we could just go missing and no one would ever know. Around that time, I started to feel really off about him. My friend and I needed to go back to the ferry so we wouldn't miss the next one, and currently, we were like 40 to 50 minutes away from the ferry by car. He had told us he would bring us there, which was great for us. However, he clearly did not have that planned. A little bit into sitting there and talking and whatnot, he took out the illicit toy that I had mentioned earlier, opened it, and showed it to my friend. She freaked out and he laughed and brought it back to the front. He then proceeded to unzip his pants and have his way with himself directly in front of us, taking my hand and making me do it. I was in such shock that I literally froze in fear that that was the tipping point and I honestly was terrified for my life. He had shown that he was truly unstable. He had made me do that as well as inappropriately touching me and I freaked out and tried opening the door. He got mad and tried to grab me by the wrist while I was screaming to be let out. He told us he wasn't letting us out, and I was finally able to get the door unlocked and ran out to the park, hyperventilated and my mind was racing a million miles an hour. My friend, thank God, was able to unlock her door and get out too. For reference, this park has wooded areas around it and is just beside the Coquitlam River. So we ran into the wooded area down this embankment, going through until we saw the river. We were going to cross it, but the current seemed too strong and it looked cold, so we decided to try and leave before he found us. Meanwhile, this guy kept calling and calling, like not letting down whatsoever. We finally went to go back and we had to climb back up this embankment. I boosted my friend over it, as it was a bit annoying to get up, and she ran off to a family that was there picnicking. It took me longer to get up. Like I said, it was annoying to get up and it was a bit slippery. And when I did, he was running towards me as he was looking for us and apparently I came out at the right time. I ran towards my friend and that family. I fell almost immediately when I got to them. I never cried so hard in my life as I did that night. We went to the hospital. They contacted our parents from there. And man, were they happy. 
then to the police station and slept in the hallway of an office on the floor. It was a long and exhausting night, finally, when the time came for court, we saw him again. He had a look of pure hatred in his eyes. It turns out he was 33, almost 34, married. They also found some pretty screwed up stuff on his computer. Stuff to do with abductions and minors. He said that we were trying to blackmail him. That if he didn't buy us booze and smokes that we were going to call the police. Even though they had found traces of his DNA on my jacket in hand, his lawyer got him off with three months in jail. I believe my friend said he gets weekends out, but I don't recall if he did or not. I had to leave after my statement and questioning as we had to go drop my dad off at an event, so I wasn't there for sentencing. They said we were really lucky to get away. Given how unstable and all the signs were, according to the police, they thought that he may have had other plans. They couldn't pin him with anything other than sort of the statutory on a minor. Three months, though. Blew me away. He was not allowed to have a computer, go anywhere that children are, schools, parks, malls, etc., and, and that's pretty much it. My sister's friend added his email and shocker after it all. He added her and she pretended to be underage, and he acted the exact same way. So he didn't change. So next time you meet someone in person, make sure you stay safe because you never truly know who you're meeting. And if you're reading this, James, I hope the retribution that you deserve finally comes your way. I guess I'll start with some backstory. I am a female working in a predominantly male industry and the only female in my company to have been in a STEM position. I started here in my late 20s and garnered a lot of unwanted attention from male colleagues considering the average age for the employees here are in their 50s. I attended a well-respected university and got my bachelor's degree in a field of science. I have worked hard my entire life, paying my own way through school while working and I do not like to sound full of myself, but I am intelligent, hardworking, and I take pride in what I do. However, given my choice of university and degree, I was one of the few females in my classes. After a while, you get used to being the only girl and learn how to shrug off all of the sort of degrading comments. I have had other students suggest that I did something with the professor to earn my good grades, and others suggest that I shouldn't be asked to show them how to solve homework problems because... I'm a girl and don't know what I'm talking about. If anything, these comments just pushed me to prove myself even more. I thought that when I graduated and went into the industry that those comments would become far and few between. I travel with my position and work with customers frequently. This usually entails taking customers to dinner, on the company dime of course, and that is where the most inappropriate comments are made. However, there is the rare occasion that someone in my workplace crosses the line. It takes a good bit to really get under my skin. I have only ever had to file harassment cases against another colleague once in my life, and that is where this story begins. There was a man that worked in my company for longer than I had been alive. He was in his late 60s, overweight, and had bright white hair. He basically looked like a creepy Santa. Before I was hired, he was demoted for some involvement in another case that had gone to court and ended in a monetary compensation of the victim. The colleague, however, still had the respect of the head of the company. He was viewed by the CEO as being all-knowing in the industry. The rest of the company had a different view of him, though. He was notorious for saying explicit and inappropriate things to hourly associates. He was rumored to have been paying some associates for certain favors if you catch my drift. Knowing all of this and his propensity to run his mouth to the rumor mill, I have always interacted with him with my guard up. When the incident took place, it was a Monday morning. I was walking down a hallway of sorts and told him, Good morning. How was your weekend? As I do with most of my colleagues. I am a friendly and personable individual, so this is a normal Monday morning behavior. He replied that his weekend was good. He had taken the previous Friday off and said he enjoyed his long weekend. He then went on to tell me that he had a dream about me on Friday night. I was slightly shocked and responded, Oh. He continued to say that he dreamed that I called him to a private bathroom at the facility. 
Then, when he arrived in his dream, I was completely without clothes. He then proceeded to tell me all of the graphic things that he and I did in his dream. He even went as far as saying that he woke up in a state of being aroused, and I'm just paraphrasing here. I was shocked at what he was saying and just tried to walk away, not saying anything. He kept following, trying to tell me about the dream, and I was so uncomfortable and was not sure how to handle it. A few days after the occurrence, I spoke to a colleague who I trusted to tell what happened, and my colleague urged me that this needs reported and that if I didn't, they would. I was very hesitant to bring it up to the CEO. I am a survivor of childhood abuse. I never told my family until I was manipulated into it in my mid-twenties. The aftermath was catastrophic to me as well as all my relationships with most of my family. Not having proper support during that time made me feel as though I would experience the same if I brought this to the attention of the CEO, who so adored this colleague, so... Given the choice of telling my story or having my story told for me, I would rather control the narrative and tell it myself. I went and reported the incident. The CEO acted as if they were mortified that this occurred. They assured me that it would be dealt with, that they would report back to me before any action was taken. The following Monday, I was forced to attend a regularly scheduled meeting that both I and the colleague would be in, as well as the CEO, and I was incredibly uncomfortable. This meeting lasted two hours, and I had a migraine by the time it concluded from all the stress. When this meeting ended, the CEO pulled me aside and spoke to me behind closed doors. The CEO told me that the colleague was spoken to regarding this incident, that the employee did not deny the allegations, but that after having spoken, they now better understand what had occurred. The CEO spoke, almost insinuating that it was my fault. The CEO even put the disciplinary decision up to me, saying, I can either fire him or not. I felt uncomfortable being put into a situation to choose the disciplinary action, I also expressed my concern that the perpetrator would speak about this with others in the facility, as we both know he loves the rumor mill. I was assured that this would not happen. Two days later, I was told the final decision was that the colleague was told not to do it again, and that is all that would be done. Meanwhile, I was still forced to interact with this person daily, and it caused me a lot of stress. Soon, I had other colleagues mentioning to me that the perpetrator had been telling everyone what happened that I asked for it, and basically victim-blaming for the incident taking place. This hurt me more than the initial comment did. The fact that my name and reputation was now being drugged through the mud because of unwarranted advances broke me. I went to the CEO again and told him what was happening. He assured me that he would investigate. He told me not to talk about this at all with anyone, not even HR. A week went by and nothing happened. I couldn't take it any longer. I was still working with this person. They were still spreading rumors and lies about me. I went to a lawyer because I didn't know what else to do. And after getting some legal advice, I decided to confront this head on. I wrote an email to the CEO and expressed I felt I was not being properly protected, that my reputation was tarnished and my business was being told through the company. I was told by him not to speak of this, and yet the perpetrator was still walking in every day and speaking lies about the situation to everyone, even hourly associates. The CEO called me as soon as he received it. He was overseas, so could not talk to me in person. So the conversation with him regarding the email began. The CEO began to berate me, call me a liar, and said that if I knew what other people were saying about me during his interviews, I wouldn't be too happy. I broke down on the phone and couldn't even speak. After several minutes of his belittling, he finally told me to take the rest of the day off, that he would ask the perpetrator to leave until he returned from his travel and could address this. After everything was said and done, they decided to retire and left the company while I was out of the country for work. I returned and had never seen him again. However, this wasn't done yet. I was later called into a meeting with HR and the CEO and they began to tell me that during the process of interviewing, complaints were made against me saying that I was the only one saying inappropriate things. I tried to contest, but it was promptly shut down. I put my head down and let them both condemn me and discipline me for things I hadn't done. When I left the meeting, I was ready to walk out of my position. How had things gone from me reporting an incident of harassment to me being accused and condemned for harassment I didn't commit? Unfortunately, I still work at this company. Every day I go to work and try to make it through the day. 
I have a family that depends on my income and therefore I keep pushing through. Maybe one day I will find a position in a company that actually respects me, but as a female in this industry, I highly doubt it. This is something I wanted to talk about but never found the courage to until now. Some irrelevant details will be taken out. I'm an art student and I attended an art college. I applied to school in the summer of 2018 and was accepted almost instantly. I posted a partial screenshot of my acceptance letter to Instagram to connect with other accepted students and that's the first time I talked to Matt. Matt, at first impression, was a very kind and soft-spoken dude but he was still very outgoing and talkative. He was also high-spirited and had a good sense of humor. He told me he was autistic straight away, which I didn't really pay much mind to. I was more focused on how happy he seemed to be that we were talking, as I know it's harder to make friends when you struggle with things like that. I did absolutely nothing but be nice to him, and I guess it contributed to what happened. When the time came, everyone moved into apartments and dorms and prepared for school to start. After classes began, Matt wasted no time in telling me how he was doing and asking me if I was doing okay. I just answered honestly as nothing was inherently wrong. We talked occasionally and made some friends as the semester dragged on. The first red flag popped up when he suddenly asked me while we were on a class break about my pan orientation. I had mentioned it on Instagram posts before and I had no problem talking about it with people so I gave him the most basic definition. I'm attracted to anyone, regardless of who they are. He seemed to understand. A while later, he messaged me over Facebook saying that he was sorry for asking such a personal question. I mistakenly told him that it was okay, that again, I didn't mind talking about it. I say it was a mistake because he must have taken it as she's attracted to anyone regardless of anything, so that means she's attracted to me. I enabled him to think this, I believe. The semester passed and Matt didn't do anything more to cause suspicions. It picked up when I realized after looking through some old messages between old friends that I could count all the times he'd asked me to eat with him at the diner. I'd forgotten about the instances because I just gave him the same answer each time. I don't think I have time for that because I'd rather focus on school. He always said he understood, but the amount of times he asked said otherwise. I thought since he was or is autistic that he just didn't understand those social cues. He needed a firm no to fully understand. Pretty soon though, as the second semester trudged by, some more red flags popped up. I was told by some classmates that Matt was acting pretty weird with a lot of girls around campus, as in he kept asking them out on a date but vaguely like he did with me. The kicker was, if he was told that the girl he was talking to was non-binary or that the girl was trans, he would get disgusted, contrary to his comments about his support of LGBT and doesn't care if people are trans. Matt was slowly gaining a reputation of just being off. Nobody was saying this because he was autistic, surprisingly, they were saying this because he started showing his true colors. He didn't take criticism well and would make a day of it. Mind you, this is an art school. He had no filter when he was pitching stories and would always make some discriminatory jab at physically and mentally disabled people or LGBT plus people. He was still asking if he could hang out at this point and I was getting tired and creeped out. I didn't want to be any more blunt than I already was being because I was telling him no. I don't think I could have answered him any simpler. Anyway, the semester continued and one night during another class break, Matt sat me down and told me that he wanted to ask me a more personal question. I assumed it was just about what we had talked about before, but it was worse. He asked me with the wrong amount of cheer in his voice, What does it feel like? I was confused. What do you mean? I asked. What does doing it feel like? I hadn't done or said anything to warrant this, so I was shocked that he even asked. Before the break, the class was listening to the teacher talk about our assignment. It didn't have anything to do with anything inappropriate or anything close to that. We didn't even talk to each other the whole time. I was so confused, but I didn't want to make him angry or sad either. I just answered his question. Nowadays, I would have screamed at him, 
what's wrong with you and not cared if I made him angry or sad, but at that time, I was just too nice and too dumb. I told him that everyone experiences it differently and in my experience, it wasn't that great. He got visibly excited. No, not that kind of excited, which made me cringe so hard I felt my throat and uterus dry up. At that point, the realization of the severity hit me and I spent the rest of the week beating myself up for not being disgusted right away. I still feel like this now as I'm writing. Matt dropped the subject soon after again, apologized over Facebook for asking a personal question. I told him that was fine, despite wanting to tell him that he was disgusting for even thinking about asking me something like that. Once again, too nice, too dumb. The final straw came when I realized that he was looking at my Instagram story at least a minute after I posted them. The quickest that he viewed them was 10 seconds. It felt like he was becoming obsessed with me. I messaged Matt finally after the second semester finished. I asked him to basically back off because he was acting weird, but for some reason, he kept making excuses and didn't want to admit that he was being invasive. Long story short, he basically told me that he was worried about me and whined about how he thought that I was going to harm myself. I had been reflecting on my mental health and he took this as though I was going to end my own life. He also told me that he talked about me to his counselor and instead of telling him to leave me alone, she encouraged him to continue pursuing me and enabling him to be a creep. I still don't know what she was thinking. I exploded on him, bluntly telling him that he was making me extremely uncomfortable and I don't want him to be around me anymore. I didn't want to talk to him and I certainly didn't want him talking to me. He saw my last message to him but he didn't reply. From then on, Matt left me alone but he continued on to others. He just didn't get a single hint and he didn't want to learn that his behavior was creeping people out. He continued asking people he thought were girls out and would make a scene if they rejected him. He would harass them as well, also asking them about how doing it feels, why he wasn't worthy of them, and why they wouldn't be in bed with him and why he didn't have that kind of life. He expected them to answer him normally, probably because I answered him normally. Matt also harassed several friends of mine, one in particular was extremely disgusted by him, she was asked the same questions that he always asked. She was also too nice, so she just told him that that was not important and school came first, since he was here to get an education. Also, she liked girls. He just continued to complain that he wanted to be part of this kind of life, just like everyone else. I guess after realizing that nobody wanted to date or sleep with him, Matt moved on to just being even more of a jerk. He began to pitch extremely transphobic stories for class and would cry like a banshee if anyone, trans or not, told him that his stories were in fact transphobic. He acted like he was the victim because he wasn't allowed to make fun of or bash these people, while he was in a classroom full of them. I know it sounds like he was obsessed with these kind of people, but that's because he was. He took pictures of them without them knowing and would show these pictures to random students and ask them why the people in the pictures were dressing the way they were and why they were that way in the first place. Everyone pled with him to stop, but he just continued. That community that I know of from the school all had some sort of weird encounter with him. One person in particular told me that he kept trying to ask them out, as he was completely convinced that they were actually a girl and that they were just trying to lie to him to get out of it instead of just not being interested. In addition to this, Matt began to disrespect his teachers and refused to take any and all criticism of his work. If anything was wrong, he would simply tell them, Oh, I guess I can't do anything right. I should just quit art altogether. And again, would just make a scene. He even began to sleep in class in front of the teachers and wouldn't care if he was caught. Matt's teachers simply allowed all of this to happen because he was autistic and therefore apparently couldn't do anything wrong. And with this, they've successfully allowed this dude's harassment and general terribleness to spread to the point that almost nobody talks to him anymore except for his teachers. Yes... My school was terrible like that, and yes, I have called them out. You can guess what was done about that. Right now, Matt has been extremely quiet, and his art has taken a skydive down for the worst. I feel bad for him in the sense that his mental health took a toll, but I also don't feel bad because he did terrible things and he needs to understand that. I don't think he does, and that's only because I lost hope for him long ago. Sometimes I think about how it could have all just ended if I called him out right in the beginning. 
nobody else would have been subjected to Matt's nonsense. He came back. He's been at it again. I was home alone for two nights due to a family emergency and honestly, everything just broke out. The camera we set up broke. Something to do with the wires. Stepdad wasn't very happy about that. Also, a bit of info of where I live, my home is surrounded by forest. It's not a big area full of loads of houses. Each house is separate. There's 11 houses in my street and this one street is surrounded by forests and you have to walk about 15 minutes to get to the corner shops and it takes about 45 to get to the town. It's a small area. There's a few streets but they're all spread out with a few houses in each one. Each street is separated by big bushes and gravel paths. So my mom and stepdad left the house on Monday at around 8 so I was left alone for the night. I was keeping myself busy by tidying up and playing on the Xbox. I noticed it was starting to rain pretty heavily so I ran out and started to take the clothes off the washing line and as I was doing that, I noticed all the new bras that I had hung up for to dry were gone. My undies were gone too. I panicked looking around knowing that he had came back. I got all of the clothes and locked the doors and windows. As I did this, the letterbox made a squeaky noise. I stopped dead in my tracks knowing it had to have been him. I went over to the letterbox and found a note. The note was written in scrawly handwriting and it said, Hey G-Cup, having fun? I sure am. I miss seeing you running, I miss watching your chest bouncing, your bottom look so amazing in those pink shorts last night, can't wait to make you mine, gorgeous. I'm not going to lie, I sat and cried reading the note. I had worn velvet pink shorts the previous night and had gone outside into my garden to put the bins out, so he must have been watching me. I put the note down on the counter and ran around the house locking the windows and closing blinds and curtains. I called my stepdad and explained what had happened and what was going on, and as I was talking to him I heard a big crash outside. It sounded like a bin had been tipped over. I peeked through the curtains in the living room and sure enough, one of our bins had been moved and placed right outside the window. I ended up calling the police and explained what had happened and they said to call back if he tried to enter the house. They said unfortunately they couldn't do much due to him not really doing anything wrong. They were also really short staffed at the time. My uncle was a cop in my local area and after I rang the cops I rang him and he said the same thing. After about an hour and a half of no activity I began to relax. I decided to order some pizza and as I waited I decided to quickly run to the corner shop and get a smoothie of few cooking things and some nibbles. As I went out, I obviously made sure I locked the door and I brought my hunting knife that I had gotten off my cousin with me just in case. I got to the shops without an issue and got home fine. It's about a 30 to 35 minute walk there and back. I got inside the locked door and got changed and put a plain pair of shorts and a vest top on. My pizza came and I brought my pillows and blankets down and got cozy in front of the fire and watched a few films. Anywho, as I was sitting and watching them yet again, I heard the letterbox open. I paused the film and went and looked at the box only to find another note in the same handwriting and it said, Hey baby girl, love the outfit you wore today. Dang, G-Cup. I can tell you don't need bras, you really suit dark red. Hope you saved me some pizza. Bet you ordered a veggie, it's your favorite, right? With garlic sauce? Better save me some. I read the note and felt ill. I called the police again and they said they send a patrol car down, which they did, and after an hour the car left. I ended up falling asleep downstairs that night at around 11 and woke up at 9 the next day. The whole day went by incident free. My mom and stepdad called to check on me and my uncle dropped by and gave me 60 euros to spend since my birthday is coming up and that was about it. The real horror began later that night. I had decided to sleep in my parents' room since there was a big fancy TV and I knew I had to have RuPaul's Drag Race Marathon on. I got some food and drinks ready and yes, I ordered another pizza. I locked the house up, turned all the lights off and went into my parents' room and locked the door and started my sad marathon. About two hours into watching it, I heard some weird noises downstairs in the kitchen area. I didn't pause the show, but I did silently walk to the bedroom and listen to see if I could hear anything else, and about two minutes later, 
I heard the creak, and it was the sound of the stairs. I tried to just brush it off as house noises, but as I finished that thought, another long creak. I started to wonder if it was something on the stairs. I stayed quiet, had my knife with me and my phone, and I opened the messages app and made sure I could quickly text my uncle if things escalated. It's funny, but at the time I actually wasn't thinking of the stalker. I was actually thinking a burglar had broken in. The area I live in had experienced a few break-ins with the lockdown going on and the dudes doing it hadn't been caught. I stayed quiet again. I heard a creak. There was another noise coming from the stairs. Another creak. It was getting slightly louder, which meant to me that it was getting closer and now I knew these were definitely footsteps. I texted my uncle telling him I thought someone had broken in and he texted back saying, Are you sure? It might just be house noises. I told him I was positive. It wasn't just house noises since it repeated every two or three minutes, which I don't know about you, but that to me sounds like someone trying to sneak up a flight of stairs. My uncle said to keep listening that he was on the way. I decided to turn off the TV and lights so the person didn't know which room I was in since the door had a small gap which light could be seen from. The stairs have a bend so he wouldn't have immediately seen the light and he would have to go through each room to find me. At the time, I didn't think it was a stalker. I thought it was a burglar. A stalker hadn't even crossed my mind. I was worried someone was going to steal all my stepdad's stuff. He's a tech lover and we have some expensive gym equipment. We have a tap out punch bag which someone had tried to steal a year ago from my garden. My brothers caught them so we ended up letting him keep it in his room. I stayed quiet clutching my knife and creaking continued up the stairs. I sat thinking to myself, if they try to get into the room, am I going to have to fight? I had knife training, uncle and real dad had taught me, and I knew how to fight but in that situation I just froze up. I've been in some brutal fights and I myself have been stabbed but I didn't know if I was going to be able to fight what I thought was a burglar off. I didn't even know if it was just one person at the time. I thought that there could have been more than one person here. As I waited for my uncle to come I could hear the steps getting closer until they were at the top of the stairs. I was at the door waiting for the person to come and try to open it but they didn't. They went straight towards my room which was the very last room the furthest away from the stairs. I know this because I could hear them walking towards it. The landing had creaky floorboards near my room which is next to the bathroom. I was confused. I thought that any burglar would start with the first bedroom that they could see and work their way to the very last one. This guy didn't. He went straight to my room. I heard the person going through my things, my wardrobe and drawers. I heard what sounded like a bin bag rustling. You know, that particular rustling noise the black bags make when you put stuff in them. That's what I could hear, just kind of muffled. I heard the person ruffling through my drawers, and then all the noises stopped, and I heard someone sigh. It was a deep sigh. Something about it sounded familiar to me. The person then went back to rummaging around, and then eventually it moved from my room to the bathroom. I heard the bag rustling again for a few seconds, then it stopped. It went quiet for a bit, then... I heard something, heavy breathing and low moaning. The dude was mumbling stuff and I could make a few words out. One word he said a few times was the F word. I started to panic a bit wondering what was going on and then I realized why the sigh sounded familiar. It was him. It was the stalker. And he was back in my house. I just knew it was him and then I started to connect the dots. He went to my room first because that was his true intentions in the first place. The rummaging around was him taking my clothes, my bras, panties, anything else he likes. That was why he had the bag. And then I stopped in shock and realized what he was doing, what the heavy breathing and moaning was. I felt sick. I felt so sick. He was taking my things to play with his bloody meat rod. I messaged my uncle again telling him and asking him where he was and he said he was on his way but that it was going to take about 30 minutes due to a breakdown. I then realized that the noises had stopped. I put my phone down and moved very slowly and quietly to the far corner of the room and sat down. I couldn't hear anything, absolutely nothing, and then it happened. I know you can hear me. I know you know it's me, Jesse. 
He spoke so loudly and with so much authority and confidence it was so creepy. Oh god, was all I could think of. I also know something about you that no one else knows, he said. So much cockiness was dripping off of his voice, it was sickening. What is he on about, I thought to myself, and I was silently crying at this point. I know you probably think, Jesse, what is he cracking on about? And I've been watching you a while now, babe. I know your habits so well. I know what you love and what you hate. I know everything. He said in a sort of low yell. This burned into my memory. I don't think I'll ever forget it, and the worst part, the part that made me physically sick, is the next bit. I'm getting impatient now, Jesse. I'm sick of chasing you about and you're playing hard to get. He shouted, but not super loud. He was getting closer to my parents' bedroom now. I bet you're wondering why I came now. Why I picked this particular time to come. Well, I'll tell you, to put it simply. I know your period's ended and I know this is around the best time for you to get pregnant. Had I been able to see him, I bet my life he would have been smirking. The way he said it made me ill. He sounded so arrogant it was mad. I was stunned. Completely stunned. I began to throw up. Not due to shock, but due to the fact that he was right. I know it sounds ridiculous, trust me, I do, but he was actually right. I have an app that tracks my periods and it also tells you when you're ovulating and at that time I was and it really was the best time. I felt disgusted and so violated just by his words, and I wanted to know how. How did he know this? So I did something stupid. I shouted to him and asked him how he knew this, and this is what he, exactly what he said to me. Jess, I'm not thick. I tell you I know you and I know your habits. I know when you start. I know everything, Jesse. When you're on the rag, you always go out to the town and buy tampons, and you always end up buying face masks and fruit and veggies. you always gone to ask to do it. I told you I'd be watching you. You didn't believe me, did you? you always empty your bin out after a few periods ended as well. Since you put them in the red bin in your room, you empty it once they've ended. I watched you do this, I kept track of you doing this, and I marked it on my phone. See? I do pay attention. I do care and love you. I'm not like the horrible pricks you've been with in the past. I pay attention. He was getting angry and he was banging on the door. I was crying out loud. Now I felt sick. I was terrified and shocked someone was sick enough in the head to do this, to go this far. I messaged my uncle telling him what the stalker said and what was happening and he said he was about 15 minutes away and to stay in the room. Stalker guy started to bang louder on the door demanding I open it saying stuff like, We're gonna make beautiful babies. Little babies. I was terrified. I had no clue what was gonna happen. I just sat and cried asking him why me? What had I done? You ain't done anything. I just want you. He said this in such a calm and cold manner it gave me goosebumps. This was the only response I got. After that, all he said was gross things about my body. The door started to chip at the bottom as he was kicking, and at this point I was screaming and crying and begging him to go, to just leave me alone. I shouted and told him I was just 18, I didn't want kids. I said I was young and that I didn't want to go through this or have kids, that it didn't work, it only made him more excited. My uncle texted me saying he was on his way still, but he was stuck and said that another officer was coming down, but that he'd be about 20 minutes. I was so angry and scared I was in the middle of texting him back, asking why he was stuck and what he meant when I stopped and noticed something. Stalker had stopped pounding on the door. It had gone silent. I gathered up the courage to walk towards the door and I put my ear against it and nothing. It was silent. I waited for another minute and still no noise. I decided to unlock the bedroom door and slowly open it to see if he had gone. I opened it very slowly and I couldn't see him or hear anything so 
I stepped out of the room and slowly made my way to my room. He wasn't in there, but my room was a mess. He had gone through my wardrobe and drawers, like I said, and had taken all my bras and undies out of my drawers. I felt sick, but pushed on. I walked out of my room and looked into the bathroom. The bag wasn't there that I expected to find the bag with my things in, but no, it was gone. I left the bathroom and started to walk downstairs, and yes, it creaked, and with each creak noise, I cringed and kept thinking that he was going to hear me and come running at me. He didn't, though. I got down the stairs and slowly walked towards the kitchen, and no one was there. I looked into the living room, and to my horror, he was sitting there, on the couch, elbows on his knees, his head down, just sitting. I gasped quietly, but it was loud enough for him to have heard, and his head shot up, and I could see he was staring at me. The living room curtains were open, and so was the living room window that I had shut, and I knew I had shut it. He looked me up and down, and stood up and started to slowly walk towards me, and I started backing off as he got closer. I ended up backing into a wall like a bloody idiot, and he stopped right in front of me and just stared at me. He put his hand on my cheek, which is when I noticed that he was wearing gloves. Leather gloves, or at least I think it was leather. He looked at me, then looked down at my chest. I was crying, not knowing what to do. I have never felt true fear this intense before, and I don't think I ever will again. His eyes in the dark no longer look beautiful to me. They look like black pits. His long black hair wasn't tied up like it usually was. It was flowing down past his shoulders. He wore all black like usual, he had his hood up, and he was staring at me so intensely, I couldn't move, I was so scared. I know you all probably think I'm an idiot for not shouting or screaming or attacking him, but honestly at that moment, I was paralyzed. His hand went from my cheek down to my neck. He was tracing my neck and surprisingly gentle. He then got to my chest. He put both of his hands on them and gently squeezed. So juicy. So soft. He muttered under his breath. He ended up moving his hands onto my hips. He was so much taller than me and I could tell that he was strong. I found my voice and said, Cops are going to be here soon. If you kill me, they'll catch you. God, I must have sounded like a terrified little kid. He looked at me, sighed and said, <laughs> I wasn't going to hurt you, Jess. The only moans and screams that would come from me touching you will be when I'm shagging you, babe. He took a deep breath, put his fingers under my chin, lifting my head up, and continued. But if you feel that scared, I guess I can wait. But don't make the wait too long, babe, because the longer I wait, the rougher I'll be. He then let go of me, walked back towards the couch. He picked up a black plastic bag, presumably with my stuff still in it, and he threw it out the window. The cops think that's how he got in. They think he managed to open it and climb in. And he climbed out. He took a few steps and turned back and said, I love you, and I will be back. And with that, he took off running with the bag. He ran and I couldn't see him anymore. I stayed standing there looking out the window for what felt like forever, but it could have only been a few minutes. I shook myself out of the trance that I was in and ran to the window, trying to see if I could spot him, but I couldn't, so I closed and locked the window and pulled my curtains back. I left my phone upstairs and decided to run back up and get it. My uncle had been texting me and trying to get in touch. I had a few missed calls from my mom and stepdad and cousin. I was in the middle of texting when I heard sirens. The cops. I was so happy I actually started to cry again and I ran downstairs. The cops came in and a few minutes later my uncle showed up. I told them everything and they took a statement down and started to look around the house but there wasn't much physical evidence or anything that could help. The only thing they took of interest was the window in my room. My mom and stepdad came home and we went to my nana's for the night while the house was cleaned and searched. I'm back home now and the police are still investigating. The police patrol the area I live in a lot more now due to the risks of him coming back and the fact that he could potentially try and have his way with me. 
I'm talking to an online therapist due to what happened. I don't sleep much anymore and I don't eat. I get flashbacks and panic attacks a lot now. My parents are looking for somewhere else to live now and we're even considering moving to a completely different area in England altogether. At the time of the story, I was 14 years old. Now I'm 18, and even when I think of it, it makes me anxious. The story takes place in Bulgaria, for anyone who wants to know. It was a very hot summer night. I just got home completely exhausted and just wanted to lay on my bed and wake up two days later, but my grandma said that I needed to take a shower first. For some reason, that particular night, I felt really strange. All day, I felt really weird and couldn't enjoy the day, and I was still feeling the same way. I washed myself and went straight to bed. I woke up and saw the clock saying 2.34 a.m. I didn't know what I woke up to. It was either that I was really thirsty or my brother snoring. I got up to get water, but then, just then, my phone rang. It was my best friend, who I'll call S, just for privacy reasons, and I picked up. He wanted to play games because everyone was asleep. I was ready for it, but I still had that feeling. Just as I was saying to S that I was going to get water and come back straight away, I heard an insane scream. I didn't know where it came from. At first, I thought it was from the game S was playing, but he apparently had his PC not even on. I looked outside of my house, but no one was there. I asked S if he actually heard it too, and he said yes. And just as I was about to ask him to look out of his window, I heard a window breaking and a horrific scream from S and then everything went from zero to a hundred really fast. There were screams coming from S, and doors slamming shut and loud thumps, but suddenly, everything stopped as fast as it started. There was complete silence from the other end. S just hung up. I quickly called the police, and getting ready to go outside, I woke everybody in the house by screaming at the dispatcher to send officers as fast as possible. After several hours of waiting in the hospital, I finally got to see S, and he looked horrible. His house was apparently destroyed. The police caught a completely insane person with a gun pointed towards S, and as far as I know, if I didn't call the cops, S and his parents wouldn't be in this world anymore. When I was around 16, my grandma passed away. She lived in Pittsburgh, PA. We always felt guilty about not being able to see her as much as we would have liked. It was an eight-hour drive. We only left Pittsburgh because my dad's job was transferred and it was an eight-hour drive away. On the day my grandma passed away, our dog randomly started looking up at the ceiling in the kitchen and started barking and whining. My dad and I both said, Oh wow, grandma's spirit must be checking in on us. The funeral was very nice. I remember my grandma raving about a beautiful new set of crystal drinking cups and glasses that she had gotten recently, so when we stopped by her house where she had been living alone, I asked my parents if I could take the set home, and they said yes. We got home and the dog was back at it, barking at the ceiling or just whining. Some days would pass and nothing. Sometimes it was annoying and happened multiple times in a day or night. Me and my dad still had this comforting thought it was my grandma though and thought it was pretty cool to be honest. The bathroom upstairs was above our kitchen and that's where the dog seemed to be barking at. My parents slept with their door cracked and the bathroom door open which was across the hallway with a nightlight in it. On several occasions my mom, who was the skeptic of the supernatural, would wake up at night. She wakes up about three times a night and is a poor sleeper while my dad would have required an air horn to wake up and sees lights flickering in the bathroom. She thought the night light was dying and we got a new one. This is when the entire bathroom light started flickering on and off when she would wake up. Again, she figured out a rational explanation, some sort of electrical problems. I can't tell you why she didn't find it odd that she only noticed it happening at night after she woke up from her sleep, but never during the day or evening or night, even when she stayed up late. She didn't seem to care or think about it. Electrician comes and says nothing is wrong with the wiring. The house was only a couple of years old. That's what got my mom to start paying attention. 
So she's sleeping and wakes up and the same thing happens. Lights are flickering in the bathroom. But she stayed awake this time and watched and waited. Then, instead of flickering on and off, the entire bathroom light just stayed on. She waited a little while and then got out of bed and the bathroom light switch was flipped on. She flipped it off and returned to bed and fell asleep. The next day she made it clear to the family to remember to turn the bathroom light off when we were done in there. Maybe she was still thinking the electrician missed something. So fast forward a few days and it's still happening but the part that had my former skeptical mother now completely spooked was that the light switch would be down in the off position when she went to bed and turn back on in the upright position when they'd come on in the night. I got blamed a couple of times for that. She thought I was flipping the switches on purpose to freak her out, but I wasn't. A few days later, she could hear the light switch being flipped up and down loudly and obnoxiously, then stopping in the on position. She didn't go turn it off this time. She said it gave her a bad vibe like something wanted her to go in there, almost like a setup or trap. So we just closed the door at night and turned the light off that would inevitably be back off in the mornings. One night I wake up crazy thirsty and go downstairs and get some water in my grandma's crystal drinking glass. The glasses had no stem or anything, just a standard cylindrical glass with a flat top. I fill it with room temperature tap water. Call me gross, but my teeth are sensitive and I don't mind drinking tap, which is relevant because what happened next could have been blamed on a swift temperature change perhaps in the glass. As I'm walking with my cup of water, room temperature and no ice, I pass underneath the bathroom and the moment I do so, the bottom of the glass falls out and water's everywhere. When I say the bottom fell out, I mean that the bottom of the cup simply separated from the cup, perfectly separated. There was no glass shards, just a hollow tube of crystal I was now holding what now looked like a crystal coaster on the floor and of course water everywhere. I cleaned it up and went to bed with another cup of water in one of our stupid plastic drinking cups and yes the upstairs bathroom door was closed and I could see the light framing the doorway. Those glasses meant a lot to me because they were hers, they belonged to her, so why would she do this? And I almost cried. She told me that she wanted me to have them when she passed away so I know she wouldn't have been mad that I took them home. The barking and whining, the light flickering, a light that had been turned off then double checked just turning back on, the loudest persistent sound of the switch going up and down, the fact that these glasses were causing anxiety to my mom and making her already poor sleep even worse, and ruining my crystal glass. There were no more events after the incident with the cup. I moved out a few years later, but stayed there for 10 plus more before moving out without any other events. Why did this stop with just the broken glass? Who or what decided to take temporary residence in our bathroom when my grandma died? Because that wasn't my grandma. When I was 17, my friends and I found this spot a little bit out of town where you followed this long dirt road down to the train tracks out in the middle of nowhere. We'd drive down there to hang out, smoke, and watch the occasional country train go past. One night I was out there with a buddy and we were sitting on the bonnet chatting. We noticed a set of headlights coming down the dirt road. Naturally, we were a little freaked out because it was a pretty remote spot and it's the middle of nowhere. We figured it's some kind of like-minded people, but that once they see us, that they would most likely turn around and go somewhere else. And they get to about a hundred yards away and they stop. We're able to make out that it's a big truck and think it might be a council ranger. They stop there for a few seconds before they turn on a bright spotlight on the roof and begin to slowly drive towards us. This scared me because the only people I know with spotlights on their trucks are hunters. My friend obviously felt the same because he told me to get in the car. There's only one road out from this spot so we were pretty uneasy about driving past this person to get out but we felt like we needed to leave. As we approached the car we tried to see through the windows but they were so heavily tinted that it was impossible. We looked for the council logo but it was unmarked. We'd driven maybe 200 yards past them and I look in my mirrors to see that they're turning around and start following us. 
I sped up to gain a comfortable distance from them and when we hit the outskirts of town, I drove down a random residential street and parked between two cars. I turned off my car and headlights and we sat and waited. We saw the truck drive past the top end of the street where we had entered, but I felt like I should wait a little while longer before leaving. Eventually, we see them drive past the bottom end, the streets are a grid design, and then the top end again. This happened a couple of more times and we realized that they were looking for us. My blood ran cold when I saw them enter the street that we were on from the bottom end. We both climbed into the back of the car and crouched down into the footwell. I grabbed a bag and a couple of jumpers from the seat and pulled them over us to conceal us. I could see the headlights of the truck moving slowly past the car and all I could hear was my blood pumping in my ears. Thankfully, they kept driving and turned off the street. We jumped into the front seats and drove in the opposite direction, and we were on high alert, gunning for the highway and hoping we wouldn't run into them. I have no idea who they were or why they were following us, but I'm so glad that we left the train tracks when we did, and we never went back. Hey friends, thanks for listening. Be sure to subscribe and click that notification bell to be alerted of all future narrations. If you got a story, be sure to submit them to my subreddit, r let's read official, and give and receive feedback from the community, and maybe even hear your story featured on the next video. And join my Discord to interact with me and other listeners directly. And if you want to support me even more, grab early access to all future narrations for just $1 a month on Patreon, and maybe even pick up some Let's Read merch on Spreadshirt. And check out the Let's Read podcast, where you can hear all these stories in long compilation form and save huge on data, located anywhere you listen to podcasts. Links in the bio. Thanks so much, friends. And remember, I only wrestle anime girls.